Okay. Uh, thank you all very much for coming back. Um, so, <clears throat> so today I, I want to start from where we left off last time. So last time we stated a theorem. of Herbert Koch, which was that if omega is a given solution of to the Euler, so a simplified version, um, if it's a given solution of to the Euler, and we set mu of t to be the uh, L infinity norm of the gradient of phi at time t. And if you fix epsilon positive and time independent of each other. Um, okay, so this is C2 solution. Then there exists a V or a Omega bar, that's smooth, so that at time zero, they are uh, very close in C1, but at time capital T, um, they're potentially far. Okay, so Okay. Phi is the flow of omega. Yeah. The velocity produced by omega. Okay. So this is what we stated and I kind of proved last time. Okay. If you guys accept it. <coughs> so let me now uh, give an application. So this application is, uh, it's, uh, we're going to suppose something so that we don't know. So, so, so you know, suppose that for a dense set of Omega zero in C one, let's say of T two, just to, or okay, let's say omega. Okay. Omega is okay, nice. Just think it's T two, okay. <coughs> we have that the gradient of the flow. Okay, so now omega zero is a function. There's a unique Euler solution. Phi is its flow map. Okay. Suppose you have that this goes to infinity for a set of functions. For autonomous functions, that's true, right? Almost every autonomous function, the gradient goes to infinity. Of course, I'm not saying autonomous functions. I'm saying Euler solutions. Okay, so that's a big assumption. Okay, so this is all okay. Where the heck is he getting that from? Okay, but just assume it. Okay. Then for a dense set omega zero in C one, we have that. The solution goes to infinity. Okay, so the I should say the supremum in time of this is plus infinity. That's the correct statement. Okay. 
So if you uh, almost direct consequence of Koch's result is that if you knew somehow generically for Euler solutions the gradient of the flow is unbounded in time then you know generically the solutions are unbounded in time okay this one okay, if you really think about it is okay in order for the gradient of flow to not be unbounded in time it means the particles are moving in an extremely rigid way right as we saw in the autonomous case the only way is that they just go around all at the same speed, which is extremely rigid. The non-autonomous case, okay, you could imagine, you know, can, yeah. No, infinite, infinite. This, this, is, this is infinite time. Yeah, because they're all going to be C1 for finite time. Okay, is, is that okay? So, <clears throat> I should remark that the fact that this implies this, I learned it actually in a talk of Patrick Girard in a summer school like this one that I attended in uh, 2015 in Rome. Um, and it was about something completely different, about the cubic Zego equation. That's what he talks about um, these days, or, or back then, I don't know, right now. Um, so the point is you should pay attention. And, and even if you don't really care about what people are talking about, you should just... No, 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 I, I, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't mean that I didn't care. I mean, even if you don't care. <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. Even if you don't care about Euler, then... Uh, it's, it's usually in any way. So let me explain the proof. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe to motivate that, I state a case when you can actually prove this. <coughs> so let me I mention a theorem so so this was joint with uh, uh, Ryan Murray and Ayman Said and um, it's following so it's observation so suppose so we consider so all of these ideas are local, it doesn't really depend on the domain. So consider 2D Euler on R2 or S2. So it's actually geometrically sounds nicer on the sphere. And suppose we restrict to solutions that are M-fold symmetric. About zero, or the in the sphere case, the north and south poles. Okay, so just if you rotate, say by two pi over m, it looks the same. Okay, vorticity is the same. Okay. <coughs> for some m greater than or equal to 3, then um, the assumption holds. So assumption and conclusion okay, hold. Okay, just because you need to restrict to symmetries. <coughs> okay, and it's a very simple idea. You just think you can do it on the on R two, but it's maybe nicer to think of it on the sphere. You just suppose that 
Because it's n-fold symmetric, the north and south poles, or zero and infinity, are fixed points. Okay? So they're, they're not moving, because you have symmetry this way. The velocity vanishes at these points. And you can prove that under this assumption, if the solution is smooth, then the local rotation, so if you, if you take just the expansion of the velocity field, so if you, in fact, if you expand the stream function, so maybe for this I do it on, the, on R2. So if you expand the stream function, you get that it's just a constant, which you don't care about, plus the vorticity at 0 divided by 2 times x1 squared plus x2 squared plus order of x cubed. Okay, that's what the symmetry gives you. Okay? Furthermore, this is independent of time. Right? It's just whatever initially it is, because vorticity is just transported, the vorticity here is independent of time. Does that make sense? Is that zero is a fixed point. Vorticity is transported. So whatever vorticity is here, so this is really the initial data. Okay? And the same thing at infinity. Right? And same at infinity. Okay, so if the vorticity vanishes at infinity, the particles that are very far from the center do not go around zero very fast. Right? So the if you look at how fast particles if you look at particles very close to zero, they rotate with the speed of the vorticity at zero. Okay? And if you assume that the velocity or the vorticity decays at infinity, if you take a very large circle, they also rotate, but very, very slowly, because the vorticity decays. Does that make sense? Same thing. You just get the rotation of this point by determined by itself and the rotation about this point by itself, by the vorticity here and the vorticity here. And if they're different, if they happen to not be the same, which generically is the case, then it has to twist up. And then the assumption holds. So, and then if... <coughs> so in fact, it's not only a generic statement. It's like unless... It's like... Uh, you know, there's a condition that has to be satisfied for it to, to not be the case, right? So if so omega at the North Pole is not equal to omega zero at the South Pole, I think there's a minus sign, then the gradient of phi, in fact, it grows linearly. Okay, so you actually get a rate and, and stuff like that. And consequently, you also get a rate here. Okay, so it's not such a strong clear in generality how you would ensure it unless you have some structure. Okay? Okay, maybe I give, can give the proof of this. Yes. So, uh, like x1 squared plus x2 squared is a rigid rotation, and I guess that you get this uh, growth because there are two rigid rotations with different speeds. Yeah. So, like if you go on next order in the expansion, can you get uh, more of the structure on the, on the level set along the point? Or um, not really. So, the, the point symmetry. So this m-fold symmetry, the higher m is, the more local the Biot-Savart law becomes. Okay, so the more local the... So if I take m to be like 10, then I could tell you up to order 10 what the expansion is from the data. Okay, but then at the 11th one, I'll be like, okay, it's globally determined. And then you don't know anything. Okay. 
Yeah. But I, I don't know, didn't actually think about. I, my suspicion is that if you tried to take higher m and you tried to add like more terms, you wouldn't. This is, I'm not sure. Maybe you'd gain something new. Someone should just check it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just explain. Maybe you, you understand the proof of the, the theorem. I think it's closed. That's it. Yeah. Okay. If you have higher symmetry. If you have higher symmetry, it's closed. OK, so let me prove the, the first one. So it's very simple. So you just define sets omega n to be, um, so hopefully I get this right and I'm not making some mistakes. So it's the set of all omega 0 and C1 of T2 such that the supremum in time of omega and C1 is bigger than capital N. OK, now by continuity of the solution map, can you notice that you can put rates here? So I could have said supremum in time of omega and C1 divided by t to the something, t to the 1 half, if I wanted, depending on the assumption I have on the flow maps. Okay, But all I have on the flow map is that it's unbounded, so I'm just going to make unbounded assumptions. By continuity of the solution map, these omega n's are open. So omega n are open. So now I want to show they're dense. So now we want to show they are dense. And to show they're dense, after you show they're dense, you just apply the bare category here. OK? So then omega infinity. is dense. So I should say that this, uh, I mean, this scheme is, was in Patrick Girard's talk, and it was written first by Zahir Hani. So I'm not sure it was, it's yet applied in the context that they wanted, but, but it works here, so that's good. Um, OK, how do you show they're dense? You just take omega 0 there. Well, you just take an omega 0, ah, sorry, an omega 0 anywhere, right? You take any omega 0. Then you find a point very close to it, which has, uh, so you take omega 0 prime such that the gradient of the flow is unbounded. Right? So you, you just, you know that the points where the flow map is, uh, is unbounded is dense. So you take, start with your initial point, you move a little bit away, you find another point, where the flow map is unbounded. And then you apply Cox result. You go a little bit away from here, and you find another point which goes very far, beyond n. That's it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Say it again? OK. So, <laughs> OK, so you start with any omega 0 and C1, OK? You don't know anything about omega 0 
or the flow map of its solution. Okay? But you can find a point close to it whose flow map is unbounded. That was the assumption. Okay? So you find omega 0 prime whose flow map is unbounded. Right? Because of Koch's result, if I give you a capital N, I can make a perturbation of that to go very far. Does that make sense? And a perturbation of a perturbation is perturbation, right? Okay. Make sense? That's it. So it's a really, I think it's a really powerful statement. Okay, someone has to figure out how to prove this um, in general. But, okay, in some cases we can. <coughs> All right, now I'm going to, so this was sort of the first, okay. yes. The second part. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So this was the first um, infinite time statement we made. Um, so now I want to discuss um, other infinite time results. So, okay, so this is beyond this bare category stuff. And the general idea, which is similar to um, is, which is also in the Koch thing. So the general idea is to have uh, a base steady state or a given solution that you understand. So it could be a periodic solution or whatever. <coughs> and prove that it's stable and prove it's stable. Stable means for all time. Okay, so it's just for, for emphasis. In some low norm. Okay, so this will talk a bit about the Arnold theory, so this is and then use that to prove all time instability in a high norm. Right? So cost uh, result was sort of finite time because the construction itself was based on showing that the trajectories are stable, but that can only happen, for, I mean, the way it's being done, it can only happen for on finite time intervals. <coughs> and, okay, so the uh, first result I'm aware of that really used this idea is due to Nadi Rashvili. So that's, that's the result I'll start with. Okay, so we consider the domain is t cross 0, 1. So he did an annulus. I should say that this paper didn't do anything about norm growth and it was really a wondering something else, but okay. Um, so we consider this domain. And we consider the steady state omega star is identically 1. U star is y comma 0. <clears throat> okay, 
So this steady state, so this is just a steady solution of Euler, right? Because right? That's zero, that's zero. So it's steady solution of Euler. Um, but it's also stable. So if you if you look at I said omega to be star plus omega bar. So we'll talk in a few minutes about the general how you prove stability in general. But this is just a simple example. So if you if you consider this uh, this particular case, so I think Michele did this uh, computation earlier. Okay. Now omega star is zero. The gradient star is always zero. And that's it. Okay, so this is the equation satisfied by perturbations. And observe that if the perturbation is zero, then what are the trajectories doing? So if you look at the base state, you see that the velocity on the bottom boundary is zero. So particles on the boundary here don't move. Particles up here move at speed one. Okay, so if you take, take a box, so this is like what we drew last uh, yesterday. If you just take a box like this, and you look at its evolution, okay, so if you evolve it, it's just going to, okay, this is, uh, because it's periodic, It's just going to look like that. So I think, okay, maybe Michele drew this exact same picture this morning. Okay. <clears throat> In particular, the, the gradient of the flow is growing linearly. In fact, the gradient of the flow at every point is growing like t, and uh, okay, you have this shearing. Okay, now how do we prove that the so okay, this is a first application of the Koch result. We could prove that there are solutions that start where omega bar is as small as we want and make it grow as large as we want in C1. Okay, so that would, that's the direct corollary of this. Now, okay, what if we want to prove infinite growth? Well, see that the, the boundaries, and this is a key observation, these boundaries are fixed, right? So these are fixed. A particle that starts on the boundary doesn't leave the boundary, right? So, and the Velocity on the top boundary is 1 for the base solution, and the velocity on the bottom boundary is 0. If we knew that the solution, if it starts out close to, uh, if, if omega bar starts out small, if the perturbation starts out small, and you keep this velocity difference for all time, so if you had some stability like that, then you would know that this stretching would have to continue forever. Okay, does that make sense? So if we knew, so, so let me state this. So if we could have, if we could have, I'm gonna make a long list of things. Number one, U bar in L infinity less than one quarter. 
Okay, so that's that one quarter. The bottom is moving at least, at most, at speed one quarter, and that's moving at least at speed three quarters, right? And if we could have omega bar is identically 1 on x equals 0, means this line. Okay, so let's get, let, me, let me just draw another picture. And two omega bar is identically two on x equal one. Okay, so it's like you have a level set here and a level set here. So it's one here and two here. Okay, remember the, the background. Is, con is a shear flow, so it's constant on each of these lines. So this perturbation making is exactly transverse to how the, the steady state is. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's the exact opposite of what the steady state is. We would have this for all time. So this is for all time, not the initial data. And if this was true initially, and this was true, then we could conclude that gradient omega bar grows linearly. Okay, because it's just like what we talked about yesterday. You have this will evolve as a curve, always connecting the top and the bottom, because points on the top never leave the top, points on the bottom never leave the bottom. And this also evolves that way, except these points are thrown all the way to the right, and these points are kept behind some, some amount. So these points are behind, say, one quarter t. These points are in front of three quarters t. Then you're, uh, then that's it. Does that make sense? Is it clear? So if you have, <coughs> say, you have two points here. Two points here. And this is some curve, connects there. This is some other curve, connects there. And this distance is bigger than one half t. Right? And then it must be that the vertical distance between these two curves is because the area inside is preserved. Right? The vertical distance has to be less than, I'm going to call this gamma 1 of t, this gamma 2 of t. And distance means the minimal distance. Okay, even in the y, like the, the vertical distance is less than something like 2 over t, if the area was 1. Okay. Does that make sense? No, but these are level sets of vorticity. Those are level sets of vorticity. Yeah. So these are level sets of the vorticity. Okay. <clears throat> now, why is this true? So, suppose that you had this. Okay, then we can agree. So, I, I strongly recommend you to sit down and prove this statement. So, it's really it's just by Fubini's theorem. Um, um, once you know how to do it, it's kind of obvious, but. Um, it's good to set it up. This is something, you know, it's kind of clear how to do it, but then when you actually ask to do it, maybe it's not that easy. Um, okay. How can we ensure one and two? 
So how do we ensure one and two? <clears throat> okay, two is a statement about the initial data. So you can do that for free. Okay, so two is free. Okay, how do you ensure one? That the L infinity norm of the velocity of the perturbation is less than one quarter. So, if you want to just con control the L infinity norm of the velocity, and we know that the velocity is just like that. Okay, how could you control the L infinity norm of the velocity? What norm of omega bar? So omega bar is the thing that satisfies the equation, and it's just being transported. So what would you need to control the L infinity norm of the velocity? What's that? Some LP norm like so. So W1P in 2D embeds in L infinity when P is bigger than 2. Right? So this, for example, is controlled by a constant times omega bar in L3. Okay? Right? There's a okay, so I should remark that there's a small technical point that uh, this is not simply connected domain, right? So the, the inverse of the Laplacian is not actually um, the inverse of the Laplacian as we've written it doesn't actually give the vorticity unless you assume that the circulations on the boundary are zero, okay? So that's what this forget about that. Okay. Someone says that, tell them to be quiet. <laughs> we just because the circulation is conserved. So you can just assume that the circulation of the perturbation is zero and then everything is fine. Okay. So you have this. And what is this controlled by? It's controlled by the initial L3 norm. Okay, because omega bar is just transported, right? So now you want this to be very small, and you want omega zero bar to have these level sets. Well, it's not so bad, right? You just take it to be a function like that. Right? And the L3 norm can be very small, and it can take those values. Does that make sense? <coughs> and that's it. So then, so you take... So this has a flavor of the argument we talked about... Um, of what we talked about last time. So you take the L3 norm sufficiently small, the L infinity norm order one, and that's it. Okay? Okay. So that's, um, that's the first example of infinite norm. Any question about that? What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not. It doesn't have to be that small. Actually. In fact, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's really. Uh, on this domain, it would be nice to write down the optimal statement. It really may be like. Um, something like something like that right? if that's true 
or L3 or something. Maybe under this condition you can you can keep the shearing and everything is fine. Okay. <coughs> Uh, I'm just writing something. Okay, this may not, maybe completely, maybe one over four, but it won't be very small. It's really, it's really a robust thing. Okay. I don't know people who teach here every day how they deal with the, the vibrating uh, board. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so next I want to talk about um, uh, more general forms of stability. Okay, so I'm not really going to do justice to the, the theory. So, uh, by the way, so um, for this Arnold theory, there's recent really nice work of uh, Terry Galley and Vladimir Schwerak, which you should consult after. If you're interested in this direction, you should consult for a more serious um, discussion. So. This is really about how you can use uh, conserved quantities ability. Okay? So let's just say we have a nonlinear problem, some equation. ODE on RD, say. It doesn't have to be on RD. And suppose that you have a conserved quantity. Suppose you know h of f is conserved um, for all solutions f. Okay? Then, <coughs> and suppose also that h of f has a strict local minimizer. So suppose you have something like this. So h around some point f star okay, so down here is like rd or some other space and h looks like this. So it has some local minimizer and it's a conserved quantity. Then F star is a steady state of the equation. So n of F star is zero. And Lyapunov stable. Just from this fact. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yes. If what's that? So if F star is the minimum, so this is a strict minimizer. Okay, so it means that we assume that D two H at F star is bigger than some constant F squared. Okay, so really oh no sorry. Just some constant. 
So you just assume um, you assume that this is strictly positive. Then f star is a steady state and it's stable. It's kind of clear once you once you say once you look at the picture. If h is conserved, there's nowhere you can go. Right? F star can't go anywhere. Otherwise, the energy, the h would increase, and h is conserved. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's kind of obvious, but okay. Why? You know, what does? It's kind. It's uh, strange because. Uh, what does the conserved quantity have to do with the nonlinearity, right? And it's a statement that to do with the nonlinearity. It has more to do with the conserved quantity. So let me just explain to you the proof of this. <coughs> so just so that we feel comfortable, I'm going to give like uh, two separate statements that you don't need to give, but just so we feel comfortable. Because usually when there's something that's strange, even if we have a very nice picture that explains it, we'd like to see some formulas just to make sure that it's right. Okay. And that's definitely how you should, especially as you know, when you're starting, if you think you prove something amazing, you should have at least two ways to prove it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, okay, conserved quantity means, so I just, First, we'll show you why it's a, it's a steady state. So h of f is conserved, means this is 0. Oh, so, OK, I didn't say, say what h. h. h means a function from rd to r. Right? So it's a function of OK, and n is a function from rd to rd. Okay. So yeah, so sorry about that. OK, so let's compute this. So we said it's 0. It's conserved. So we can compute this. So that's the gradient of h at f dotted with ddt at f. Which is that the gradient of h at f, the gradient of h at f, dotted with gradient n of f is always 0. Okay, oh, the, the dotted with n, sorry. Dotted with n of f is 0, right? Which means that n is like the velocity you're moving by, and it's tangent to the level surfaces of h. Okay, so you can move along these circles. Okay, which makes it really big because this Rd down here. <coughs> and then you look at this and you say, okay, let me plug in F star. And I say, oh, I don't get any information. So I must have, it's not clear at all now why it's true. But then you differentiate it again. Okay, so let's differentiate it again. Then you get the second derivative of h at f, now applied to n of f, n of f, plus gradient h at f dot ddt n of f, which I'm not going to take. So this involves a derivative of n, which you don't know anything about anyway. And now you look at it. And now you plug in f star, right? So if you plug in f star now, you see this thing, by assumption, this is 0, right? So this is 0. This thing is positive definite, so n of f star is 0. Does that make sense? Okay, I guess it's clear from the picture, but it's fine. It's good to know. Okay, now how do you see the stability?
which gives you another way to see that it's um, stationary, actually. So if you now, let's compute h of f plus f star. Okay, hopefully I make I do this correctly. So that's h of f star. Well, no, so let me not do it like this. f, which is a conserved quantity that's independent of time, just given by the initial data, is h of f star plus um, gradient h of f star okay, we have to write a few terms out I think you all see what's going on. Plus order of f minus f star cubed. OK? Is that fine? <coughs> this is 0. This minus this, so h of f minus h of f star is then, this is a conserved quantity. This is conserved. Right? This is conserved. And at time zero, because of this computation, its order, say, epsilon. OK? Um, sorry, no, no. What, what am I saying? Uh, OK, erase what I just said. <laughs> OK, this thing OK? OK, then you get, so from this thing, so d2 h of f star is bigger than some constant. So c star f minus f bar squared is bounded by some huge constant or whatever. So it's a little bit of um, a little bit of on throwing things under the rug in the statement, plus okay, so this is something about the data, right? This is something about the data, and now because h of f star is uh, since f star is the, the minimizer, this thing is bounded by a constant times f0 minus f star squared, right? 
Say that, say that H has a global bound on its second derivative or something like that. OK, so you have this. OK, then you have an inequality of the form. x squared is bounded by x cubed plus epsilon squared, right? <clears throat> right? Then you have an inequality of that form. x of 0 is the initial. Is everybody following what I'm doing? Should I start from the beginning? It's OK. So x of t is now this, this difference, it's a function of time. That's x of t cubed. And that's the initial one, which is, which is that. So if you have an inequality of that type, all you say is that if, so x of 0 is epsilon, then x of t is less than uh, 2 epsilon for all time, if epsilon is sufficiently small. Right? Because if x of t is less than 2 epsilon, you can remove this 3, make it a 2 with 2 epsilon. You bring it here. You, yes? Say that again? That's a good question. What is f bar? f bar is f star. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I think it's the same, but I'm not sure. Same. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. OK. This makes sense for everybody. But this uses nothing about n, by the way. It's, nothing, it's all about the conserved quantity. Once you know that you have a good conserved quantity, and, and that okay, it's conserved by the dynamics, which implicitly uses n, then you, you have the stability. OK? Look, so I just gave this computation because I, I would have liked to see it when I was a student. So. the base of the I still have half an hour, right? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Um, so there are different applications of this idea. I, okay, so there's a more general uh, way that, so, so the conserved quantities in 2D Euler, so you have the integral of any function of the vorticity is conserved. And you have the integral of u squared is conserved. So if you just take integral of omega squared, right, it has a minimizer, which is 0. Right? Okay, nothing to do. Right? But if you fix, if you decide, OK, I'm going to fix this one as constant, because the Euler solutions keep both of these, right? any f and, and the energy. So for example, if I fix the energy to be constant, and I try to minimize the entropy, right? This I get the first eigenfunction of the Laplacian. is a steady state, and it's Lyapunov stable. Does that make sense? So that's, if you take any domain, okay, let's not talk about the torus. We'll talk about it later. So if you take any nice domain, just from these considerations, 
you have that the first eigenfunction of the Laplacian is a steady state. So that you can see from the formula. But it's um, also Lyapunov stable for all time. Okay, that's what it means. And OK, you can build uh, all type of steady states. So let me not, OK, I don't want to take too much time on the general theory, but OK. <coughs> I'm going to give you a few examples that I think nice, a little bit different flavor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly those are not expected to be stable. So you probably can't. I'm not sure. I mean, do, do you know? I don't know how you get those from, from this procedure. So yeah, there are others, but um, they're not stable. They're expected to not be stable. Yeah. Um, yeah in, in fact, OK, so I should say, so on the torus, um, OK, let, let me talk about it when I'm going to talk about it. So the, yeah, the, the examples I'm going to give are, are three. So, so the first eigenfunction on the torus. The cellular flow. The circular vortex patch. So these are three examples of Lyapunov stable st states. And I'll show you how you can see their stability from the, the Arnold idea. So uh, first eigenfunction on the torus is simple. And it's the constant. So it's not the one that we think about. So there are f actually four first eigenfunctions. So they are sine x, sine y, cosine x, and cosine y. OK? So the state, first statement you can make, so statement one, if omega minus the projection to the first shell. So P1 means the projection to this, to the span of these four guys. So if omega minus one omega in L2 is small, then, oh, initially, then omega minus P1 omega in L2 is small for all time. Okay? That you can prove by conservation of using these two. Okay? So using these two, you can prove this statement that if this is initially small, then it stays small for all time. Say that again? Uh, uh, I mean, that's true, but on, I think on a generic surface, actually the next eigenfunction is also simple. So then you wouldn't need to project. You just, uh, it will be one, yeah. <laughs> now, the, right, the point I want to make here is that you don't know that any one of them is stable. You don't know that any one of them is. You just know the, the, the group, the, yeah, the four of them are stable. 
But okay, so this is actually a this is actually a very interesting question. So it's not known, surprisingly, so, okay, we know everything now, but <laughs> it's not known if sine of y, if any one of them is actually stable. But I'll tell you what, what one can say. So statement two. If omega zero minus sine y, so now we fix sine y in L2 small. Okay, so this is now now we go to the, the, the real definition, epsilon delta. Right? So it's not epsilon, epsilon anymore, fortunately. So, <coughs> so if this is small, then omega has to be close to some translate And the translates can be changing, right? So, yeah. Given epsilon, there's a delta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, all, we're all adults here. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Given epsilon, there exists a delta. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> um. Yeah, so you can prove that it does not migrate. So this, this statement makes it seem like you could migrate from sine y to become cosine x, okay? which means that everything was going this way, and then a long time, you come back, and now it's going this way. And you made only a small perturbation. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. So that, that crazy first scenario is not possible. This is also a crazy scenario if you think about it. Uh, so, okay, so there is one small reason you may have a lambda of t is if you have the integral of u1, um, sorry, u2. So you could have just a vertical constant velocity which would just translate you by constant times t. Okay, but let's forget about that. Let's also assume this, okay, which is conserved. Okay, so this is conserved for all time. And you would think that knowing this and knowing this should imply that lambda is zero. You shouldn't have the, the average movement north is zero and have the bulk looking like sign of something that moves uh, you know, wildly, right, potentially. But I don't think anybody knows how to prove that. OK, so this is not, this is not known, right? OK, so that would be nice. So it would be nice to, so this I just write as an open problem. Okay, so I can hide behind the Marchiora and Pulverenti, who said this is an open problem. Is sine of y stable or not? Okay, under the assumption that the mean velocity is zero. Okay, you should just, just assume that. Okay, because it's conserved. Uh, yeah. No, it could be order one. Could could grow. Nobody nobody knows. Yeah, likely that. What's that? Yeah, yeah, the integral is on uh, t two. Yeah. In fact, you can have it on each uh, horizontal line. Yeah. 
our interaction is it small or is it big? Yeah. But it remains small. Yeah, so if someone could prove that lambda is small, that would be the same. Right? If lambda remained, you know, like epsilon or square, whatever, that would be fine. But right now, as it stands, lambda could become 10. Or the, the techniques we have now, like the Arnold techniques we have now, as I know it, okay, it could be completely wrong, and tomorrow there will be a paper on the archive, which would be nice, so please. But as of now, lambda can be anything. Because the difference is really on the projection. So the, the statement is really one of this type. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, but at the end of the day, it has to be like this, right? It's not, it's a huge amount of rigidity, right? So it has to move in a particular way. It doesn't feel like it should be possible. Anyway, let me take, not speculate. I'll just tell you so you know. Okay. <clears throat> Of course, as, as remarked, uh, if you have a general surface, usually the eigenfunctions are simple. So this doesn't actually, it's not actually relevant. But it's an interesting question. OK. So what about the cellular flow? So. When you deal with higher eigenfunctions, it may be, as I said, that they're unstable. This is also an open problem. Um, but you can make them stable by restricting to a symmetry class. So you can restrict to a class. OK, so this is omega. So it's a eigenfunction of the Laplacian with eigenvalue negative 2. And um, it's a steady state, um, but it doesn't conform to that stuff. So you may, if you now restrict to a symmetry class, you can use sort of similar arguments. So there are different ways you can choose it. So one way you can say it is, OK, omega. If you draw omega or the stream function, they look the same. Minus. You could say, I'm going to restrict to the vorticities that have reflection symmetry. So they're odd with respect to x and odd with respect to y. Right? So if you restrict. If I restrict my attention to vorticity satisfying satisfying this, then I killed sine x, sine y, cosine x, cosine y. And I killed everything on the second shell also, except this one. And since I did that, now this becomes the first eigenfunction. So in this symmetry class, this is Lyapunov stable. Does that make sense? So when you restrict to this symmetry class, this now becomes Lyapunov stable. Does that make sense? So if you really want to work with this guy, you could just restrict to a symmetry class. That's one option. That's not for people who want so the, the interest in this example is that it's, so I, I drew this earlier, and I think Michele will talk about it on uh, Thursday or something. Um, if one wants to look at this uh, solution, 
you're interested in the fact that it has a hyperbolic point here. So putting this reflection symmetry forces the vorticity to vanish where the hyperbolic point is, which means that you're kind of giving up the hyperbolic point. So Denisov had a better idea of how you make this stable. So he said, forget this. Okay, maybe he didn't think of this at all, but he forgot about it anyway. He said, I want to use, I want to use this hyperbolic point. I want to put a perturbation on top of it and try to see if I can get exponential growth of uh, solutions. Right? Because at a point like this, the trajectories are squeezing exponentially here and expanding exponentially as you, as you approach the origin. So he said, if I was able to perturb this one by a bump here, then I'd be able to deduce some fast growth, right? faster than linear growth. So he said, I'm going to make symmetry, uh, fourfold symmetry about this point. So whenever I put anything around this point, I put four copies of it, right? So you make a fourfold symmetry about this point, and then an even symmetry about this point. And that, among the first two shells, uniquely selects this also. Does that make sense? And it makes it Lyapunov stable. So he does like a so fourfold around. And then twofold around zero. Okay, so really, uh, really nice idea. Okay, you can think about it a little bit. It just excludes everything, everything else lower than it and, and at its level, so it becomes stable again. I'll give you a third example, which will be relevant to the discussion tomorrow. <coughs> And that's the circular vortex patch. So oh, I, I should say that before the patch, so similar idea for a different type of steady state was used by also Kiselev and Schwerak. Okay, so so I, I would write if I could go up there. So they also use this idea of stability. Um, for a different type of patch. Um, OK, so circular patch. OK, so we consider vortex patches. So these are. So if the initial vorticity, so vorticity is transported. So if the initial vorticity is characteristic function of some set, A0, then the solution for all time by the Udovich theory will be the characteristic function of some moving set with the same area, right? Now, what's the most important set? It's the disk, right? So, what's that? If you consider the circular vortex, 
That's a radial solution. Particles just go around at different speeds. That's a bad picture. So they go slow, fast. Like they rotate uh, on in the inside. They're rotating rigidly with speed one, and uh, it gets slower and slower as you go out. Okay. <coughs> now, this is also a steady state. It's a steady state because it's radial, right? And radial solutions to Euler are steady. Another reason it's steady is because if you consider the two conserved quantities, the integral of omega and what they call the angular momentum, the integral of x squared omega, these two are conserved, right? And the ball, the, the disk, is the, is the uh, minimizer of this for fixed mass, right? It's the minimizer of this for fixed mass. Because if you start to pull things out, this is going to get bigger. Does that make sense? You have to bring as much of the mass close to the origin as you can to if you want to minimize this thing. Does that make sense? So it's Lyapunov stable. Because it's a minimizer of the angular momentum for fixed mass. Is that clear for everybody? So in particular, in the class of vortex patches, I should say, in the class of solutions that are 1 and 0. Um, so in particular, if I, if I make a, a perturbation like this, so if this, maybe the area of this is small and its angular momentum is also small, so if I make a very small perturbation like that, then it's the bulk has to remain always sort of over here, okay, without any symmetry, without anything. Does that make sense? Okay. So now um, I want to give you some, just an idea of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. <coughs> Okay. You're lucky. We may finish early today. <coughs> so, in Many of the examples of uh, uh, growth that I mentioned, so for example, the Nadirashvili example and the Kiselev Shverak example, you have to use some rigid structure in the, in the flow, like a boundary or a fixed point in, in Denisov's case. So in the, so, on the Nadirashvili example, we had to know that the velocity on here is like 1. The velocity down here is very small. right? And we have to know that these are fixed lines. The particle that starts on here doesn't leave here. Particle that starts on here doesn't leave here. So sort of a uh, situation. So, and furthermore, so, so this is kind of one, 
one issue you have. And also, when you look at the evolution, all you say is that the distance between these two points becomes order t. Right? The distance between the two points becomes order t. But you can't really rule out, for example, even though you know the coet flow is sort of monotone in here, and you know, if you go up, you should be going further to the right. You can't rule out that these curves I, I drew before don't just do like that. Right? As weird as that would be, how do you actually rule that out? Right? Without knowing that there are, so you don't know that there are, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, invariant curves except these. So you can't really know what any particle in the middle is doing. Okay? That's um, sort of a small drawback of the argument and why you, know, you would think that okay, for more, uh, for different questions about long time behavior like mixing and things like that, you wouldn't really be able just from this information to draw any conclusion. Um, so I guess a good way, good question, a way I can uh, motivate tomorrow's discussion is just to ask a question. So this is a homework problem. <coughs> so those of you who know the answer, so the people who are at Duke or who I talk to about this, should not tell anybody the answer. <laughs> OK. So let's just take u star is sine of y comma 0. OK? And we're on t2. OK? We're on t2. And suppose that u bar, okay, u minus u star, in C1 is less than epsilon. Okay, so it's really close, and U is divergence free. So everything we do is divergence free. Is it true that the gradient of the flow map goes to infinity? So, <clears throat> so you have this box, so you have a uh, curve here, say at y equal pi over 2, and y equal minus pi over 2, and particles here are going at speed 1 to the right, particles here are going at speed 1, negative 1, one to the left. So you think of, I, I draw a curve, a circle, right, around the torus. This should forever be stretched that way, and that should forever be stretched that way. And the gradient will grow indefinitely, right? Okay, so that seems to mean that this should be true, but okay, the problem is to prove it, if it's true. Without, okay, so the issue is that you don't have any, um, any uh, invariant curve anymore, right? So you, <coughs> so you is, okay, you is not autonomous, you is just anything. So. Thank you. Ah, you want to prove, okay, so 
you're proving, you're not really proving that. You're proving that omega minus the projection to sine y and cosine y is zero. How you use that is, how you prove that is you use the higher uh, conservation laws. So, so for example, it's actually a very, very nice uh, computation. I do not remember the spelling of the name of the authors. Um, it's completely out. It's actually by two physicists, I think. So what they say is that, so omega and L4 say, is conserved. Omega and L2 is conserved, right? And U and L2 is conserved, okay? So say that you're a function of the form A sine x plus B cosine x plus C cosine y or sine y plus D cosine y, okay? Then the L2 norm squared is sum, sum of the squares, right? And this is sum of the squares, right? So you have the intersection of two, um, no, actually these are the same, so these are, that's the same. This is sum to the four, is some fourth order thing involving A, B, C, and D. So you have an intersection of two elliptical-like objects, right? And in principle, you could be on any of these four, okay? But because of continuity, you have to stay on this one. If you start here, you have to stay here. It's that, that's kind of the idea. You see what I'm saying? So if you use these two conservation laws, you can rule out that you go, say, from sine y to cosine x. But you can't rule out this uh, combination. You can use any, right, so the correct thing is really to use any Casimir, so any thing. And then you can really rule out going from this to this. But the thing is, these two are just translations of each other. So you, so you cannot differentiate them by anything. That's why you can't uh, remove the lambda from this type of argument. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now there is uh, the question that I have in mind is whether this estimate is optimal. First remark is that you have a picture here on the top, the picture there, mm -hmm. and you have the boundary on both sides. And the only thing I know, which is purely rigorous, because and we really choose the truth, that is the result of Kisselev, which says that uh, with boundary, yeah. then the estimate is saturated. Now I wonder if you are going to do that in a more general case. Of, uh, do you have any intuition of what happens without boundary? Maybe it's for some more heads in the No, 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 no. no. I, I, uh, that's too much uh, to expect for tomorrow. But <laughs> um, <laughs> my. Uh, my intuition is that we should build a better understanding of uh, dynamics and get some new ideas for that. Basically, we don't know. But we are, we are understanding more about dynamics that may help us. Okay. But that's not the only... Uh, it may not be true. It may not be true without a boundary. So that's, it's not really clear. Not really clear. Nothing better than Denisov's superlinear zone in our graph. Yeah. Even though we have we have linear 
can you show today? Between linear and the double expansion bound, the only thing we know that boundary is super linear. So yeah. anything better than that is Yeah. Uh, you don't know anything. Okay. No, you don't know anything. As of now, you don't know anything. Yeah. He's asking about the behavior of lambda as t goes to infinity. But you, you really don't know anything. You can prove bounds, but it's probably not optimal. Okay. Uh, let's thank